Uh, today is a little bit bittersweet for us because this is the Obama administration's last Easter egg roll. Yeah. And if we think about what we've accomplished over these past seven years, it's pretty incredible. Some 30 Hollywood actors and directors added their voice to entertainment industry threats to boycott Georgia if the U.S. state's governor signs a new law seen as discriminating against gay people. The controversial bill passed by the Georgia state legislature last week declares that no pastor can be forced to perform a same-sex wedding. Movie and TV studios 21st Century Fox, NBC Universal and Time Warner joined Walt Disney, AMC, Viacom and Marvel Entertainment in either opposing the bill or saying they would take their productions elsewhere. Lured by tax incentives, more than 240 film and TV shows were shot in Georgia last year, bringing an estimated $1.7 billion to the state. They included The Walking Dead, Ant-Man and Allegiant. The entertainment industry joins over 300 companies, including Google and Coca-Cola, saying the law should be dropped. Atlanta is often called the Hollywood of the South. And cut it! Because of its tax incentives, companies like Disney regularly shoot movies here. Last year alone, Georgia took in nearly $2 billion from the film industry. But now, at least nine corporations, including Disney, have expressed concern, with some threatening to pull their business out of the state if Georgia passes the controversial law. It allows religious officials to refuse to perform same-sex marriages, and it would let faith-based organizations deny services or employment to people who violate their, quote, sincerely held religious belief. Georgia now joins 21 states that have passed similar laws. And we believe it's very bad for business. William Pate is CEO of Atlanta's Convention and Visitors Bureau. He says 20 companies have called him to say they will cancel their conventions if that bill becomes law. How much business does the city stand to lose? That would be close to a billion dollars worth of economic impact to our city. Are most companies waiting to see what the governor does? We believe he's going to do the right thing, and so we've asked our customers to let that process go through. fight for LGBT rights. This is the new fight for LGBT rights. We're really in an extraordinary moment where states are rolling back existing protections and actively trying to discriminate. Suzanne Goldberg is a law professor at Columbia University in New York City. It seems there is a wave of anti-LGBT laws spreading across the country. Why are we seeing a wave now? This is also certainly a reaction to the Supreme Court's decision last June to allow uh, marriage equality for same-sex couples. Lawmakers in more than a dozen states have introduced bills limiting transgender bathroom use this year. The Williams Institute says that could impact nearly 300,000 transgender people aged 13 and older. Anti-transgender bills are the new thing in uh, uh, LGBT rights because the country is just getting to know transgender people. James Essex is the director of ACLU's LGBT Project. He points out why major companies are denouncing the legislation or threatening to pull business. It reflects the reality that the overwhelming majority of Americans, coast to coast, support the idea of LGBT non-discrimination protections and are against uh, specifically singling out transgender Americans for discrimination. While none of the major corporations have enacted specific bans yet, this weekend, famed Hollywood director Rob Reiner said he will not produce movies in the state until it repeals the new law. And the mayor of San Francisco is banning city employees from traveling to North Carolina for business. This morning, we're here to announce that Equality North Carolina, ACLU, the ACLU of North Carolina, and Lambda Legal have filed suit against the state of North Carolina in federal court in the state's middle district. We are asking the court to overturn House Bill 2 because it is unconstitutional, because it violates the equal protection and due process clauses of the 14th Amendment, because it discriminates on the base of se basis of sex and sexual orientation, and because it is an invasion of privacy for transgender men and transgender women. The law also violates Title IX by discriminating against students on the basis of sex. Uh, as many of you know, this sweeping and discriminatory measure was introduced, passed, and signed into law in just 12 hours 
at a cost of $42,000 to taxpayers without advance public notice, virtually no opportunity for public debate. And during the course of the public debate, it became very clear that the legislators who were voting on this act did not understand its provisions. With House Bill 2, Governor McCrory and the bill's supporters have sent a message that LGBT people are second-class citizens who are undeserving of the privacy, respect, and dignity afforded to others in the state. From Georgia now, the governor bowing to pressure from big businesses, vetoing a religious liberty bill that opponents say would have allowed Georgians to discriminate against gay and transgender people. But tonight, conservatives insisting it's their rights that are being abused. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami now. Tonight across the country, Georgia's conservative governor in this deep red state has won both new friends and new enemies. Georgia is a welcoming state. For weeks, more than two dozen big name companies were threatening him, promising to walk away billions from Georgia in movie making and other business if he signed his name to a bill that would allow any faith-based business to refuse service to gay couples. Corporate America felt the law would legalize discrimination against gay residents and the governor agreed. I do not think that we have to discriminate against anyone to protect the faith-based community in Georgia, of which I and my family have been a part of for all of our lives. Since the U.S. Supreme Court made gay marriage legal nationwide last summer, religious groups and lawmakers have moved the battle home. What happened in Georgia today is proof that big business can make a big difference. Some of these faith-based groups here in Georgia say they're not done. If not this governor, then the next. Garland Hunt is senior pastor of the Father's House in Atlanta. He's also an attorney who worked closely with legislators that crafted Georgia's religious freedom bill. He joins us now to talk about the next move in the state's religious freedom battle. Pastor Hunt, you've been meeting with religious leaders all day. What's their reaction to the governor's announcement? Everyone I spoke to is outraged. We really are because we were surprised that Governor Deal would bow down to Hollywood, the NFL, Google, anything, the Falcons, and, and, and deny church, church people, the faith-based community, just the right to have our First Amendment rights protected. In a radio address yesterday, President Obama reiterated his promise to allow refugees to enter the U.S. So the plan includes one hundred thousand in the fiscal year 2017. GOP candidate Donald Trump responded this morning on Fox and Friends. I can't even believe that he's saying it. It's inconceivable that he's saying it. Open borders, uh, everything he said there is absolutely, you would almost say it's disgraceful. You, you can't even imagine that a man could make those statements, especially a president of this country. We need protection. We need borders. It is disgraceful that he could, he could say this, and especially when he talks about coming in from the Middle East, frankly, even more so where they're undocumented, they have, we have no idea where they come from, we have no idea who they are. It is just insane what this man is saying. Our openness to refugees fleeing ISIL's violence, our determination to win the battle against ISIL's hateful and violent propaganda, a distorted view of Islam that aims to radicalize young Muslims to their cause. In that effort, our most important partners are American Muslims. That's why we have to reject any attempt to stigmatize Muslim Americans and their enormous contributions to our country and our way of life. Such attempts are contrary to our character, to our values, and to our history as a nation built around the idea of religious freedom. Today on the sixth anniversary of Obamacare, the Supreme Court heard another challenge to the law. The Little Sisters of the Poor, a charity run by nuns, says the birth control provision violates the laws of God. Jan Crawford is at the court. We are women of the church, and so it's just important for us, um, you know, to be able to practice, to exercise our faith freely. For Sister Constance Veets, the issue goes beyond the little sisters of the poor. If our religious liberty can be um, disregarded, then, you know, what's to prevent the government from disregarding anybody else's sincere religious faith? Let them serve! At the Supreme Court, it was a clash between religious freedom and a woman's access to contraception, and the justices appeared deeply divided. 
Liberal justices worried there was no stopping point. Any religious objection to paying taxes or serving in the military could be brought. Justice Sonia Sotomayor, how will we ever have a government that functions? The government had given the little sisters an out. Simply sign a form, letting the government step in and order the nun's insurance company to provide contraceptive coverage. <laughs> but the little sisters argue they would still be complicit, and the conservative justices seem to agree. Said Chief Justice John Roberts, they think that that complicity is sinful. Now, without Justice Scalia, the court appears divided four to four. A tie vote could keep in place those rulings against the Little Sisters. The U.S. Capitol Visitor Center was crowded with spring tourists, many of them children, when a man pulled a handgun this afternoon. A police officer opened fire and wounded the gunman before he could get off a shot. The suspect is in surgery, under the knife, and under arrest. Chris Van Cleve is at the Capitol. Panicked congressional staffers and tourists fled the U.S. Capitol after reports of gunshots in the Visitor Center. Lynn Sines and his family were about to take a tour. Basically all we heard was the uh, Capitol Police saying down, 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 and so we all dropped down. And the shooting happened just after 2.30 p.m. at a security checkpoint staffed by Capitol Police, Chief Matthew Verderosa. The individual drew what appeared to be a weapon and pointed it at officers. An officer fired and struck the suspect who was subsequently treated by medical personnel. Sources tell CBS News the suspect is 66-year-old Larry Dawson, a man described as familiar with the Capitol and known to law enforcement here. A man with the same name was taken into custody in October for causing a disturbance in the House chamber, shouting, I'm a prophet of God. Urgent bulletin just issued and the manhunt tonight for an escaped murderer in Ohio. This evening, a warning for students at a nearby college to stay inside. Police say the brazen killer may be armed and ABC's Eva Pilgrim now on a possible sighting just a short time ago. Tonight, an Ohio college is on lockdown as the search continues for an escaped prisoner, a murderer now on the run. Considering the storms that passed through the night, um, we suspect the escapee may seek shelter. 58-year-old John Modi has served 12 years of an 18-year sentence for murder, robbery, and escape. He was convicted of killing a woman in Cleveland in 2003. Officials at the Southeastern Correctional Facility say guards realized Modi was missing at the 11 p.m. headcount on Sunday. The escape forcing nearby Hawking College in Nelsonville to close all campuses today, asking students to stay inside. Nearby residents also on high alert. We're going to be making sure all of our doors and windows are locked. Korea releasing a propaganda video depicting a nuclear strike on Washington, D.C. The Justice Department has charged seven hackers with ties to the Iranian government. They're accused of cyber attacks on dozens of banks and a small dam outside New York City. 
The attorney general described the attacks as relentless, systematic, and widespread. One hacker repeatedly gained access to the control system of the Bowman Avenue Dam, but the dam's gate had been disconnected for maintenance at the time. None of the suspects is in American custody, and the U.S. does not have an extradition treaty with Iran, but the case sends a warning that mouse clicks can be traced even far outside the country. is investigating after hackers crippled computer systems at major hospitals network in the Washington area. MedStar administrators say there's no evidence of compromised information, but a virus stopped doctors and nurses from accessing email accounts and medical records. Authorities are trying to figure out if that virus is so-called ransomware. That's when hackers extort money in exchange for restoring services. Printers at several colleges throughout the U.S. states of Massachusetts and Rhode Island were hacked with an anti-Semitic flyer. The flyer calls for global white supremacy and says Jews are destroying the country through mass immigration. The flyer also featured swastikas, and it's still unclear who hacked the universities. The schools hacked include Princeton, Brown, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst, among others. Other schools throughout the country were also targeted, including DePaul University in Chicago and the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. The Chancellor of Amherst has denounced the hack, calling it a cowardly and hateful act. There are growing concerns about an outbreak of a rare blood infection. It's spreading across Wisconsin and Michigan, and so far, it's linked to as many as 17 deaths. Dozens more have been sickened. The bacteria is called Elizabeth Kengia, and the CDC is working to find out where it is coming from. Here to explain is CBS News medical contributor, Dr. Holly Phillips. Dr. Phillips, good to see you. Great to be here. So tell us about this. Where is it coming from, and what is this bacteria? Right, right. So it's called Elizabeth Kengia. It has such a strange, strange name because it's actually named after the microbiologist who discovered it. Her name was Elizabeth King, hence mm. Elizabeth Kengia. This is not a new bacteria, although the strain that seems to be spreading now in Wisconsin is a slightly different one than we're used to seeing. Uh, it can cause serious blood infections or meningitis, but generally we see five to 10 cases in every state every year. Uh, but just since November, we've seen more than 50 cases in Southern Wisconsin and a huge number of deaths. So this is truly considered an outbreak. Quakes is rattling nerves this morning in Oklahoma. Both are a greater than four magnitude and struck near Crescent, that's north of Oklahoma City. There are no reports, though, of damage. The first quake hit just hours after the release of a disturbing new government report. It shows seismic activity in parts of the country's midsection are now as dangerous as in California and Alaska. For the first time, government scientists are including man-made quakes on their earthquake hazard map. CBS News Science and Futures contributor Michio Kaku is a physics professor at the City University of New York, and we're pleased to have him this morning. Good morning. Morning. So Oklahoma could be like California. That's right. Ground zero could be Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, Colorado. Seven million Americans could be affected by this report, which is a game changer. Human-induced man-made earthquakes. The number of earthquakes in the area has gone up by a factor of 100 from just a handful per year to a thousand just last year in Oklahoma alone. From the tip of coastal Northern California to the U.S.-Mexico border, the infamous San Andreas Fault runs 810 miles long. Considered one of the most active fault lines in the world, the San Andreas gained notoriety partly due to the San Francisco quake of 1906. Now, earthquakes of the past are providing new evidence that the San Andreas could work in tandem with another fault to create a disastrous seismic event in the future, one that would be particularly devastating to Southern California. Geophysics professor Julian Lozos of California State University Northridge hypothesized this scenario. He used computer models and paleoseismic data to study the 1812 quake of San Juan Capistrano. He says the 7.5 magnitude quake started along the San Jacinto Fault and then jumped to the San Andreas. If the San Jacinto, if something that, you know, starts as a, you know, if it were just the San Jacinto, it would only be a 6.7 or 8. Um, we're able to hop onto the San Andreas and become a 7.5. That's a bigger earthquake in a larger area, and so it would affect a lot more people. And so um, people in L.A., for example, who might not be thinking so much about the San Jacinto Fault might need to think about it more now.
In fact, a quake along the San Jacinto could be even more devastating than a quake along the San Andreas, mainly because it runs through some of Southern California's most densely populated areas, including San Bernardino, Riverside, and San Diego. Florida is known as the fishing capital of the world, but right now there's a lot less fishing and a lot more concern about what's happening to their valuable and vulnerable ecosystem. If you walk up and down Indian River Lagoon, you will see this. Thousands of dead fish belly up in the water. There are several different factors going into play here. One is the state received about triple their average rainfall for the month of January. All of that rainwater and runoff has gone straight into the rivers and the lagoon. Not to mention, because of El Nino, temperatures were warmer than normal, allowing for a toxic algae bloom and brown tide to take over. The algae bloom depletes the oxygen from the water, in turn killing the fish and has also killed more than half the lagoon's seagrass. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Research Institute says the fish kills happen all the time all over the state, but this one is massive. Farther south, there's another problem. Lake Okeechobee is the highest it's been in 10 years. So right now, the Army Corps of Engineers is draining it. Billions of gallons of fresh water pouring out of Lake Okeechobee. This brackish water affecting the salinity of all the estuaries. The Army Corps of Engineers says that they are backing off to a safer discharge. But if you ask the fishermen in the area, they say it's too little, too late weather headline storms are tearing through the Midwest overnight. Reported tornadoes and hail leading to a very messy Easter for so many. ABC's Rob Marciano and for Ginger is tracking the latest for us. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Rob. And boy, it was a mess, especially across the southeast. We had rain all day long, so sunrise services and Easter egg hunts were, were a bust there. But look at this. This is not snow. This is hail across parts of Indiana, all part of a big system that brought severe weather to the mid Midwest overnight. Overnight, central Indiana and Florida hit by golf ball sized hail. Oh my God. Plus, heavy rains sinking this car. Three reported tornadoes yesterday in southwest Kentucky. Several homes sustained damage in the area. An Easter weekend blast hitting the west and the central plains with up to a foot of snow, with power outages to thousands of homes and businesses. It's the weight of the branches. Uh breaking and falling, especially in some of the older parts of town. That storm whipping up winds in Kansas where firefighters are still battling the largest fire in state history. More than 600 square miles in Kansas and Oklahoma destroyed. Semi engine two, respond with Keystone for a house boat fire. And in Springs, Oklahoma, firefighters battling a fire at Keystone Lakes Pier 51 on Sunday night. Authorities saying the flames began on a houseboat and spread to others and the dock itself. Firefighters rescuing several bystanders trapped on one side of the jetty. No one luckily was injured. One of the more clicked on stories of the day, Volcano Pavlov out here in the Aleutian Island chain. One of the most active volcanoes in Alaska in general, but now erupting over the weekend. Over 8,000 feet tall, there is Pavlov Volcano and also its sister Pavlov. But the eruptions now going over 20,000 feet tall. That ash cloud is all the way into the sky. Here's a picture from Cold Snap. He was in an airplane flying from Dutch back to Anchorage and saw this. This is that ash cloud in the sky, 20,000 feet tall in the sky. So planes are going to have to fly around it. And you understand over Alaska, there's a lot of planes in the sky flying across the world. world celebrated under tight security. This was the site right here in New York City today. The NYPD on patrol as thousands attended mass at the famed St. Patrick's Cathedral and overseas tonight rioting on the streets of Brussels. Police clashing with right wing protesters, water cannons out in the heart of that city there. At the same time, investigators launching more than a dozen raids, several new suspects now under arrest. 
On this day of new beginnings and hope, the Pope and his Easter message denouncing what he calls blind terrorism. ABC's Matt Gutman leads us off from Rome tonight. Outside St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York today, the NYPD's anti-terror unit patrolling among the Easter revelers amid stories about attacks on Christian sites during the holiday. And in the beating heart of Catholicism, ahead of Easter Mass here at the Vatican, they filed through metal detectors by the thousands. Flanking the military marching bands and the ceremonial Swiss Guard in their steel helmets were troops with assault rifles. So far this morning, everything seems to have gone smoothly. The security lines have flowed pretty quickly. But the one thing that nobody expected just before the services began, all this empty space in St. Peter's Square. It was there we found this trio of college students. Our family definitely was kind of um, questioning our decision to go to the Vatican for church. My dad was wondering um, why I was, but I'm not going to be scared. Pope Francis at the altar, giving communion and praying for peace. Roman Catholic Church has lashed out against what he calls the rejection of the refugees by the countries that could offer them help. Pope Francis began his Easter message with lamenting the inhospitable treatment of the refugees by European countries. He said that it is deeply disturbing that the world is trying to trivialize the pain of those who have fled war and destruction. The pontiff also referred to Syria's lengthy conflict, hoping that the warring sides would soon settle their differences and restore peace and fraternity in the war-ravished country. Pope Francis was addressing his supporters from the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. March 7th in northwest Pakistan, a suicide bomb killed 10 people and injured 30 others. Police said the attacker detonated his explosives after guards stopped him from entering a municipal building. Police blamed the Taliban for the attack. A week later, on March 13th, the militants from the group Kurdistan Freedom Hawks set off a car bomb in Ankara, Turkey, killing at least 37 people. And on that same day in the Ivory Coast, Al-Qaeda gunmen opened fire at tourists at a beachside resort. According to the local government, 14 civilians and two members of the country's special forces were killed. Three days later, on March 16th, in northeast Nigeria, two female suicide bombers blew themselves up at a mosque during morning prayers. 24 worshipers were killed. Nigerian authorities suspect that Boko Haram is behind the attack. Also on that day in Pakistan, a blast killed at least 15 people and injured more than 30 others after an explosive device hidden under a bus carrying 50 government officials detonated. Pakistani authorities suspect the Taliban is responsible for this attack. And on March 20th in Istanbul, Turkey, a suicide bomber killed five people, including himself, and injured more than 30 others on one of the city's busiest streets. The attack was later linked to the Islamic State. As family members mourn the loss of their loved ones in, in the Brussels terrorist attacks, other victims' families around the globe are doing the same as they too remember their loved ones who have died at the hands of terrorists. Well, the complexity of Islamic extremism has reached again into Pakistan, where at least 72 people enjoying an afternoon in the park were killed by a suicide bomber. The attack in the city of Lahore was an assault on Christians on their most sacred holy day. Elizabeth Palmer has details. In the coffin, 16-year-old Sharon Petra, just one of the victims of yesterday's attack, targeted on Easter Sunday because of her family's Christian faith. But in crowded public parks like the one in Lahore, bombs don't discriminate. Most of the parents left desperately looking for their children in the chaos were Muslims. Afzal was on the scene. The kids, he said, were on fairground rides when the bomb went off. I carried 20 to be taken to the hospital. They were loaded onto ambulances and rushed away. The anxious parents of survivors hovered at their bedsides, while the devastated families of the dead gave in to shock and heartbreak. Assalamu alaikum. This evening, Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif went on television, promising the nation that he would do whatever it takes to uproot terrorism. 
Easier said than done, though. On the weekend, Sharif had to order police to disperse Islamic hardliners demonstrating in front of the parliament, and his security forces face a bewildering array of extremist groups. In an open taunt to the government and to those who support Pakistan's three million Christians, the Taliban faction that carried out the Lahore bombing has warned it won't be the last. for a suicide bombing that killed at least 25 people. We have the latest on breaking news involving an Egyptian airliner hijacked to Cyprus. The hostage drama is now over. Earlier video showed one man climb out the cockpit window. Several other people ran down the plane steps. The hijacker is under arrest. A U.S. law enforcement source tells CBS News around eight Americans were on board the jet when it was hijacked. All the passengers are safe. Flight 181 took off for Alexandria, heading for Cairo, but the hijacker forced the pilot to divert to Cyprus. Deborah Pat is tracking the story from London. Deborah, good morning. Good morning. The hijacker managed to divert the plane for nearly 90 harrowing minutes. His demands were a little confusing, though. He apparently wanted to make contact with his ex-wife, but it's also been reported that he demanded the release of unspecified prisoners in Egypt. Shortly after the Airbus A320 made an emergency landing, passengers, who appeared calm and unhurried, began filing out of the aircraft and down steps onto waiting buses. A member of the cabin crew could be seen directing them from one of the plane's front exits. A few hours later, several other people, possibly flight crew, emerged from the aircraft with one climbing out of the cockpit window. Egyptian television aired this photo, allegedly taken inside the cabin. It claims to show the suspect, who has been identified by Cypriot officials as Saif Edin Mustafa, wearing what he claims is an explosive vest. Minister Sergei Shoigu says the country will deploy a range of coastal missile systems on the far eastern Kuril Islands, a territory also claimed by Japan. While Russian military says it will put up more than 350 buildings for military needs on the disputed islands, which have been home to some 19,000 Russians since World War II. Shoigu also says over a thousand new weapon systems will be given to Russian military forces in the West as part of the efforts to strengthen the country's presence in the Arctic region. Meantime, Japan has protested against Moscow's decision, saying such a move will further strain the relations between the two countries. The King of Jordan is claiming that Jordanian and Israeli air forces have cooperated in confronting Russian warplanes. King Abdullah told a group of U.S. congressmen in Washington that last January the two air forces jointly confronted Russian jets over southern Syria and warned them against crossing the Israeli and Jordanian frontiers. According to the king, the Russian planes were attempting to survey Israeli defenses in the Golan Heights, and the pilots were shocked when they were confronted by Israeli and Jordanian F-16s. King Abdullah also revealed that he recently met with Israeli Mossad chief Yossi Cohen in Amman to coordinate a joint strategy in dealing with Russia. officially published a travel warning urging all Israelis to avoid traveling to Turkey and is saying all Israelis currently in Turkey should come home as soon as possible. Israel says there's a level 2 terror threat for Israelis in Turkey, meaning there's a high concrete threat. On Saturday, Turkish police warned that the Islamic State might target Christians and Jews. Israel is also saying that terrorist groups in Turkey may try to attack Israeli tourists and Israelis should avoid visiting the country if possible. Turkish officials say there could be an imminent attack against a Jewish school in Turkey. The officials say the Islamic State is actively plotting to attack Jewish kindergartens, schools and youth centers in Istanbul. In recent days, Turkey and Israel have both warned of increased danger for Jews and Israelis. But now it's become a concrete threat. The community center in the Beoglo neighborhood of Istanbul was specifically warned that it's in danger. 
and security sources say the attack could happen at any moment. As we reported last night, Israel issued an alert for all citizens to leave Turkey as soon as possible. The warning came nine days after three Israelis were killed in a bombing in Istanbul. Thousands of people in the besieged Gaza Strip have attended a rally that was organized by the Hamas movement in solidarity with the new Palestinian Intifada, or popular uprising. The event was held to stress the importance of liberating Jerusalem al-Quds, which is widely respected by Muslims worldwide. The new Intifada began last October after Israeli settlers and soldiers stormed Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is Islam's third holiest site. The Hamas leadership in Gaza called on all Palestinians to support the Intifada and the resistance against Israel. We are here to support the new Intifada for the sake of Jerusalem Al-Quds and our people in the occupied West Bank. This Intifada will lead us towards the liberation of our land and the martyrs who sacrificed their lives and their blood are paving the way for us to achieve our goal. The event also included artistic performance depicting Palestinian resistance against Israeli settlers and soldiers in the occupied Palestinian territories. The protesters voiced their support for the new Intifada. This Intifada is for the sake of Jerusalem Al-Quds, and I call on the entire Muslim nation to support it even with their prayers, because Al-Quds belongs to all Muslims. The people in the Gaza Strip want to boost the morale of the Palestinians in the occupied West Bank by holding big rallies and protests like this one in solidarity with the new Intifada. Palestinians in the besieged coastal enclaves say that they will continue to support the new Intifada and the resistance against the Israeli occupation until the liberation of Jerusalem al-Quds.